My name is Donna Ruther and I'm from Adult Services and I want to welcome everyone to the program this evening. Thanks for coming. Um, Roy is one of our most popular uh, speakers and programs, so I'm glad everyone is here tonight. Um, he's going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll do questions. We're going to have everyone muted during the presentation and then we will uh, take everybody off mute so questions can be answered. And uh, I just want to tell you, um, starting in May, keep a look out at our calendar. And if you live in Euclid, you should be getting uh, the Euclid Observer. We're going to have, we don't have a lot planned due to COVID just ending and possibly coming back, but we do plan have some in-person programs uh, planned. So keep an eye out on that. And hopefully everyone can start attending in-person programming soon. So uh, thanks for presenting tonight, Roy. And if you want to start the presentation, that would be great. Very good. Thank you, Donna. Thanks to the Euclid Public Library for organizing this. Tonight, the topic is Moses Cleveland Trees, Cleveland Living's landmark, Landmarks. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the trees today and what they were yesterday. But most of the presentation will be on what we can do with the Moses Cleveland Trees, why they are important for the future of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. My name is Roy Larrick, and uh, I'm wearing two hats tonight. One, my own organization, Bluestone Conservation, which is a uh, watershed group uh, around town. And so I work on basic watershed education and also then uh, restoration, stream restoration, habitat restoration. And uh, that's my primary job. And then I'm also on the board of directors of the Early Settlers Association of the Western Reserve. And uh, you will hear how the Early Settlers Association has been part of the Moses Cleveland Trees Project since 1970. And uh, I'll just say that the tree you are looking at now is a wonderful red oak in the North Chagrin Reservation. Um, it was designated as a Moses Cleveland tree in 1946, and red oaks tend to put out uh, big roots. They have what we call root flare, a good root flare that supports them, buttresses them, in this case on flat land in shallow soil, but also red oaks tend to grow on the lip of ravines where some of those roots support them by uh, growing down the ravine. Uh, anytime you see an oak with roots like this, you can almost bet that it's a red oak. Now, uh, for tonight, uh, a couple of topics. I mentioned uh, Moses Cleveland trees as survivors from the native forest. These trees we're looking at tonight are all about 250 years old, some a little less than that, and some quite a bit more. Uh, but um, they should all descend from the time, 1796 is the, you know, the reference date, uh, from the time when our region was forested. And uh, our, our region, uh, Northern Ohio, along the lakeshore, wants to grow trees. Uh, there were a few prairie spots, a few wetlands without trees uh, in 1796 and earlier, but basically the whole area was forested. 98% we think was, was forested under a climax forest. And uh, so we'll talk about the survivors of that forest. The big topic tonight for me is uh, how we can see the Moses Cleveland trees as guides for reforesting Cleveland, Cuyahoga County. That is how these trees can help us regrow the canopy or enhance the canopy. As you know, the uh, you may know that the uh, that the uh, county generally has about forty percent coverage, and that's uh, primarily from the leafy suburbs. Um, uh, the city of Cleveland it's, itself uh, has less than 20% coverage of forest, used to have 100%. And we are in Euclid tonight, uh, Donna and I, and the, um, the rate is 28% in Euclid. We're trying to get it up to the county average of 32%, 32 or 34%. Okay, so how can they help? How can the Moses Cleveland trees help us do this? And under that, there are two topics. And one is that I want to talk about some of the Moses Cleveland trees as representing 
anchor species. That is those that have given us trees that have lived to be 250 years old. So, you know, those are the kinds of species that can do it, that can give us big trees. And um, in that category, I'll talk mainly about species associations. I will speak of Moses Cleveland trees, especially the oaks, because most of the designated trees were oaks and how those oaks can indicate the, uh, the substrate, the environment uh, under which they thrive, where they have uh, preferred to grow. And then each of those oak species has uh, species that are associated with it. Uh, so these trees grow as an ensemble in an ecosystem, and it's a kind of co-evolutionary development. So if you find certain kinds of oaks or maples or beech, there's only one species of beech, but um, if you find one Moses Cleveland tree, you know that it's thrived in that area, that local area, and along with other species, so species association. I'd like to mention climate resilience, but it's a complicated topic, so we won't get to much of it tonight, maybe in the question periods. Then we drop to the level of the trees themselves, and I'll just call them kingpin trees, those magnificent trees, such as the first one I showed you, that, uh, uh, that have made it to 250 years old. So why have they made it? How have they made it to that age? And there are two um, features, two variables that are important. One is tree genetics. All these trees are programmed to be able to grow big in, in uh, Northern Ohio. And, uh, but the other, I think more important is site character. Um, all, tr all these species we'll talk about can grow to be big, but the site has to be right. It has to be right at the beginning to give the tree a good foothold. And uh, of course, the site has to have stayed somewhat undisturbed or disturbed in a certain kind of way that allows the tree to thrive over a couple of centuries in now quite urban environments. So site character will be very important. Just to go through this in a hurry, uh, the Moses, Cle tr Moses Cleveland Tree Program was started in 1946 when 153 trees were designated of 23 species. And that great number of species, it's not the full number of species in the native forest, but it's about two thirds of the, of the, the number of species that uh, were growing uh, back in 1796. So that was the first chapter. The second chapter came in 1971 when the Early Settlers Association got involved and did an inventory of those 153 tree sites. And they found 92 standing after 25 years. That is about a 60% survival rate at that time. And then the Early Settlers Association got interested in doing their own designations. And over another 15 years, uh, they designated another 120 trees of just seven species, preferring the oaks, because obviously they found that the trees that survived were the oaks, um, the, the trees that had survived the first 25 years were above and beyond the oaks. And so why... Why not go with a good thing? So uh, just seven species, most of which were oaks. And then uh, we come to the present and in 2021, and 2020 and 2021, um, a number of groups did an inventory, we'll see. And uh, so an inventory of all 273 sites that we found evidence for, and 70 trees were found standing. So after 75 years, the survival rate for Moses Cleveland trees in general is about 25%. And the thing is that, all right, the first trees were designated in 1946 and they should have been 150 years old. They were designated for the uh, 150th anniversary of the city of Cleveland, okay? Those that were designated from 71 to 86 uh, were also, uh, they tried to get trees that were equally as old. so. It's not that the younger designated trees were younger trees of the later designated trees. They were all of about the same age. So we can say that after 250 years, the survival rate is about 25% right now in 2021. And that survival rate will diminish pretty quickly over the years. Uh, the inventory for the last couple of years was done by two groups, the Early Settlers Association, President William Barrow, and me working as chair of the 
um, the Moses Tree, Moses Cleveland Tree uh, Committee, and then the Forest City Working Group of Sustainable Cleveland. Uh, Kathy Len is the director there, and a close colleague Courtney Blaschka. Uh, so two groups, Forest City Working Group, Early Settlers Association, and about 20 volunteers worked on this for a year and a half or so. And I would like to just show you the names of uh, the dedicated volunteers. Uh, that uh, those these are the volunteers who time after time went out uh, to look for trees that were hard to find and got the photographs, got the measurements and made the notes on them. So without these, we could have done it. And just to show you a bit of eye candy here, uh, it's best to see Moses Cleveland trees in places where there is more than one. And there are several places of that nature. Uh, the best place is Lakeview Cemetery. Uh, and this gets back to our emphasis on sites. These Moses Cleveland trees, big trees survive best in a well cared for environment. And Lakeview Cemetery is, you know, a private or commercial cemetery, and they have the means uh, to do good maintenance on their own and hire professional arborists when needed. So uh, seven trees have been designated in Lakeview Cemetery and seven trees survive. It's the only place where the survival rate is 100%. And the trees range from a beach in the upper center there uh, to a couple of tulips on the right, up and down, a black oak, and then two white oaks uh, up and down on the left side there. And both of the, they're all beautiful trees, but the white oaks are especially beautiful. Uh, okay. And then the other place that's really nice to see Moses Cleveland trees, although they aren't labeled, is Forest Hill Park, the Great Meadow, especially. So right on top of the escarpment, uh, the park that's in East Cleveland. And there are five or six trees, four of which are pretty much visible if you know what you're looking for. And if you're interested in seeing me about a map of uh, where these trees are. And, uh, the, and we'll talk a little bit about this environment. Both Lakeview Cemetery and Forest Hill Park are on the edge of the Portage Escarpment, the north edge. So they had a forest that was different, you'll see, than other parts of the county, highly populated with oaks. And so you find a lot of nice old oaks in these areas. Uh, Forest Hill Park has, you know, it started out as John D. Rockefeller's estate. It was highly maintained, too much maintained. The Great Meadow, as the upper shot shows, is an oak forest that was cleared out. The whole understory was cleared out to be, in Rockefeller's terms, a meadow. And that means that it was not self-sustaining and very few young trees have grown up. And the old trees uh, exposed without understory have become kind of brittle. So they're starting to fall now. And they are, they're just unmaintained. There's no arborist, professional arborist in them. But still, as you can see, these trees are wonderful. Now, just a little bit, um, if we can back off uh, to the statistics of it all. In uh, 1946, 153 trees were designated. And just visually, we can see that if you take that uh, pie chart as a clock, uh, that uh, the oaks run from 12 a.m. Uh, down to 5.30 or so. So it's about 50, 46% oaks were uh, designated in 1946, okay? And the rest of the 55% or so were other species, including beech, which in the prehistoric form of forest was the dominant tree, maples uh, that are also kind of co-dominant with beech, uh, but not quite. Uh, they're beautiful trees, so they were sought after for designations. And then um, elms were going out at that period, so there was a uh, uh, there was an attempt to designate to find and designate as many big old elms as possible. And then the tulips are always nice. And then there's the special species. Uh, and I'll speak a, few, a bit about these special species. Uh, but there were those that were two, three, five designated for each of uh, about 10 different species there. Okay, so that's 1946. If we go to all Moses Cleveland trees designated, you see that that clock hand goes around to, what, 66% or so uh, of uh, oaks, the, all of the yellow and the black, red, and the rest. Oaks, uh, beech, uh, 19 altogether, maples, 36, you could read them. And the special species 
uh, we're at 31 for all 273 Moses Cleveland trees. Okay, so through time, more oaks are designated, and in part because the other species don't live as long as oaks, but the oaks are always beautiful. So they make good trees, especially on the side of the road, good viewing trees. And uh, just one more way to look at this, if we go through all the four periods of designation, 46 to 80, 84 to 86, we see that percentage of oaks creep up from 46 to about 60, 68 or so, uh, to nearly 80, and then to more than 80 in, in 84 to 86, okay? The other species dropping out. And if we put all this on a map, sorry, it's kind of blurry, the oaks are the yellows and the oranges. So they dominate, of course. And um, this is this is where I started with. This is what I started with in terms of what can we do with these trees? You look at this and not only do oaks dominate, but oaks dominate on the west side. Why should this be? If you look on the east side, especially that line, that vertical line is the Chagrin Valley. And that's the most diverse area for Moses Cleveland trees. And that's right in our the heart of our beech maple forest. So it should be pretty diverse there. Uh, and then there are other special areas. I think you can see, if you can see my cursor, this is Lakeview Cemetery in Forest Hill Park along the Portage Escarpment. So uh, diversity, but highly oak there. And then oaks along the beach ridges on the west side and on the till plain. This will become clear, but this is the topic tonight. Why are, why do different trees grow in different areas of Cuyahoga County and how can we use that natural variation to repopulate the canopy on a natural basis? Okay, the uh, big figure here for Moses Cleveland trees and understanding the native forest is Arthur Williams, who during the 30s and 40s was a curator at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And uh, he, the Moses Cleveland trees in the sesquicentennial of uh, 1946, was his idea. And uh, he uh, was a PhD, an ecologist, and uh, as you see, quite dapper. There's not any picture of him where he's not wearing a fedora and um, a suit and tie. Uh, and there he is measuring a big cottonwood tree in Rocky River Reservation. Okay, so this was publicity for the debut of the Moses Cleveland Tree Program back in the summer of 1946. And so we have, once again, Arthur Williams, who was the first one to think about why different species of trees grow in different areas. How can we categorize that? How can we understand and what does it mean? Now, he's not the only one, and I would say he has uh, several intellectual descendants. Uh, there's Harold Wallen of Cleveland Metro Parks, who actually was a contemporary of Arthur Williams, who he's long gone as well, but uh, chief ecologist for Metro Parks at the time. And then later on, Barbara Andreas, who's worked during the 80s and 90s, retired from KSU. Jim Bissell, a name many of you know, recently retired from uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and Connie Hausman, John Rainier, uh, Cleveland Metro Parks working currently, and Katie Flynn, Baldwin Wallace University. Um, all of these people have taken on the same question, usually in more detail, adding specific information to the general patterns that uh, Arthur Williams found. And so I am going to begin with Arthur Williams's patterns here. And his um, one major publication is a book of 1949 called The Native Forest of Cuyahoga County. And it was uh, this project was in the works when the Moses Cleveland, Cleveland Tree Project came up and uh, the research informed the project and the project informed the uh, writing of this book, certainly. And you see this wonderful big old beech tree in the North Chagrin Reservation there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, once again, Williams working in the 1930s, Depression, 1940s, World War II, and uh, resources were kind of limited and you know, technology kind of limited altogether. Uh, his maps were good, but they were hand drawn. And uh, we'll see where we can take these. But he divided the county up into five different 
regions uh, or areas. So the highlands, southern and eastern, and the eastern is what we know as the east side heights. The southern highlands are uh, bordering on Medina County, but uh, the higher parts of Parma, Parma Heights, and south through Broadview Heights, Strongsville, as you see, Brexville, Okay, and the equivalent, but uh, a heights that is different. You know, we don't identify the west side heights as the heights or the west side heights as we make the big deal about the eastern heights. Okay, but then the Lake Plain is a big area below the Portage Escarpment. On the west side, there's this Till Plain, which is kind of between the Lake Plain and the Southern Highlands there, an interesting area on its own. And then what's not marked here are the floodplains of the Cuyahoga, the Rocky River, and the Chagrin River there. And then the escarpment, especially Portage Escarpment, especially on the east side there, where it's labeled escarpment. Okay, these are Williams's um, uh, areas. And you see, he has this nice little summary. I'll just read it. I don't like type on slides, but this is the one you're going to get. Cuyahoga County presents a sort of ecological crossroads in North America. Forests are differentiated by factors of topography, soils, drainage, microclimates, and general location. These are the variables we're going to talk about briefly tonight. All right. So my part in all this, after uh, the Moses Cleveland Tree Survey was done, and I had the ability to go back to Williams's and others' work. And uh, I come up, I take what Williams did and characterize it in the following ways. The green uh, type is going to be the more humid, the more cooler. The highlands that are, you know, usually a couple degrees cooler uh, in the summertime uh, because they're high. You get to Akron, you know, if you listen to the radio, Watch TV, Akron's always a few degrees cooler in the summertime than we are in Cleveland. And so the associations, I talk about associations, and this is uh, the associations I'm giving you here uh, are only going to be two trees. That implies more species than two. So you've all heard the beech maple climax forest, okay? And that was the dominant forest, especially in these highlands, especially the east to a lesser extent on the western or southern highland. And hemlock and beech, these go together. The hemlock is a cool species. You can throw white pine in there as a, uh, a yet cooler. The ravines, the north-facing ravines, the north-facing rock faces, cliff faces, are hemlock beach associations. And then on the right, I'm going to give you one that I like to cite myself, a hemlock um, uh, magnolia, uh, magnolia cuminata, cucumber magnolia association, that's especially prevalent at the basis of the Sharon knobs. You know, Nelson's ledges, Thompson's ledges, Kendall, Virginia Kendall, uh, ledges and several others there uh, always have hemlocks and these cucumber magnolia trees uh, in a nice association. And then uh, we go to the drier areas and the drier areas can be, uh, you know, no area around Northern Ohio is dry. It's all pretty humid, but you know, there's a variation between uh, humid and uh, less humid, you might say. And that depends on slope. So, you know, if you have a highly sloped surface, water runs off as much as it runs into the ground. And uh, then uh, you have soils that are a little more porous, and those are especially the old beach ridges and other kinds of uh, moraine deposits that have a lot of sand, okay? If you have sand, you get a drier area. So slope, sandy soil, and another one is south-facing. The south-facing slopes, even if they're not steep, they get more sun, they tend to be a little drier. And then we can go to, you might say the driest and the dry woodlands. Uh, sorry about the uh, acronym there, but BS is uh, the beach savanna, beach ridge savanna. And that's a very rarefied type that I'll talk about, uh, but it's very important ecologically. And then the bare rock, those cliff faces, the moraine slumps, where especially with recent erosion, you get just a bare rock and you get some trees trying to hang on in those situations. And then if we go down low, especially, we get a couple of different kinds of forests. The floodplain forest on the right, which is based around elm 
primarily. And then there are the pin oak flats on the Lake Plains. Euclid was a big pin oak flat at one time, Rocky River, West Lake, excuse me, Bay Village. And um, those are defined around pin oaks. There can be stands of nearly pure pin oaks. And once again, there are several areas, Euclid was one of those. BF is the black forest. And you've all heard the term black swamp farther west, uh, another elm-based forest that can have standing water in it. And then the, uh, the upland equivalent is uh, what Williams called the upland swamp forest. So whenever you have the beach maple complex, there's almost always upland swamps there because we had a lot of swampy areas. They're all drained now, but uh, swampy areas on the, on the uplands. Okay, so basically you've got three different, uh, three different categories based on temperature and moisture. And then there are some variations on the right-hand side within those, okay? Now, if we take these and try to put them on a map, it looks terrible. Uh, but you see the, if, if you can uh, appreciate my cursor here, the, the black forest pin oak flats on the Lake Plain, the beach ridges, the dry oaks, the escarpment, uh, chestnut and oak, oak chestnut uh, association, and then the oak hickory associations on the southern facing slopes in the southern part of the county and on the uh, tilt plain over here. And uh, the eastern highland is the domain of the humid, cool, humid uh, beech maple forest on the southern highlands as well, but not quite so much. And you have some here uh, below the portage escarpment. Okay, so that doesn't look very good. Let's see what we can do with that. And first of all, I want to um, update Williams's map uh, with what we can do with um, LIDAR technology that is extremely accurate um, uh, determinations of elevations and uh, giving you an extreme amount of uh, elevation detail. You can pick out, of course, the, the gorges, the Rocky River on the left, um, the Cuyahoga that I've outlined, the floodplain, the Chagrin River on the right, and the Eastern Highland, I call it the Western Highland, but those areas that sit on the uh, Sharon Sandstone or Sharon conglomerate, conglomerate bed on the east side, they're all about the same, but 1,250 feet above sea level. On the west side, it's 30 feet higher, 1,280, as opposed to 570 feet for the for the lake itself, and then these beach ridges, especially Warren, Whittlesea 730, and Maumee 760. You know, it's not a great difference in elevation, but it's enough to make some difference. And because these are sandy environments, these ridges are really different than other places. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this. Now, Williams was big on, um, uh, on wind direction as a determinant of the forest. And we talk about the uh, snow belt on the east side, the east side heights and farther into Geauga County, Lake County, Ashtapula. And uh, we talk about the escarpment the hill and the, uh, the moist um, uh, wind, uh, moisture laden wind that uh, rises and the, um, the vapor condenses and becomes either rain or snow. Snow belt works all seasons. Uh, it's not just a winter phenomenon. But we think, when we think of snow belt, we think of those winds that come from the north. Well, there are northerly winds that do that, but as you know, our, um, our prevailing winds are westerly in some sense. They can either be due west, most of them are actually from the southwest, some from the north, okay? The point is that westerly winds of any type will contact that eastern highland and give us snow belt conditions, whereas the westerly winds almost never touch the western or southern highlands and the snow belt is not in those areas. They are drier. The west side is basically drier measurably than the east side. Okay, So Williams did make a big point of that for explaining why the beech maple forest was uh, more predominant on the east side. Okay, now if I do the same thing, if I just put those there on my map that has terrible colors to begin with, uh, you still don't get much. So for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try something different. And instead of trying to make sense of the species association in two dimensions horizontally, I'm going to add the third dimension 
in the form of two profiles, two, call them geo profiles, one on the west side and one on the east side. Okay, and I hope this is going to make sense in the next slide. Okay, so if you take those two lines and you put them out, the eastern one is on the top, the western one is on the bottom, and that's a slice through uh, the lands to the east and the west of the Cuyahoga Valley. So the Cuyahoga Valley is there in the middle, the blue, and uh, I should have FP for floodplain forest in the Cuyahoga Valley. But um, if you go, let's start at the top here. And uh, the, I'll just uh, enumerate a, a few of the landmarks here. Those triangles on the left-hand side, both up and top, up and, and down, are the beach ridges. And they have names, Warren, Whittlesey, and Maumee that are abbreviated there. And so these are the ridges that have these, um, uh, these uh, specialized forests that are more open, uh, drier, certainly, and based around black oak. Okay. And then I have labeled, of course, the different rock components there, the lowest, the Euclid bluestone. These are the hard rocks, uh, Bray sandstone and the Sharon sandstone on top. And these, these control the geography. These give us the heights on the east side and the highlands on the south and west side. Okay. So I'll just talk about the Chagrin Island. It's, uh, we, you know, that's the name we come to call this now. Uh, the, up by tri C. Uh, tri yes, Tri-C, and then uh, it's a little farther south on the west side, I'll call it the Broadview Highland, just to distinguish where they are. All right, so this is our elevation, and then, of course, you have the south-facing slopes in this area, and you see OH for Oak Hickory, the Oak Hickory variant of the native forest is most prominent on the south-facing slopes, and especially on the west side here, where it's uh, up and down, and even on the north side of the Broadview Highlands there. And it extends actually into the Till Plain, almost into Old Brooklyn um, on the west side, almost to the beach ridges where another kind of oak forest takes over. So oak hickory versus black oak dominated beach ridge savannas here. And we have our black forest pin oak flats, which are predominant in the lake plain, but uh, Williams observed them also up here at the lower parts of the highland on this uh, till plain that we have on the west side, but not on the east side. So uh, over here on the east side, our uh, black forest and pin oak flats uh, are only on the lake plain. We don't really find them up higher as is the case on the west side. And, um, uh, but on, and especially on the east side are the upland swamp forests because there's so much highland on the east side that there's not on the west. And we have these buried pre-glacial valleys on the east side um, <clears throat> that um, uh, the, mm, the precursors to the Chagrin River, uh, a lot of uh, valleys that have been filled with glacial till, glacial material that uh, were swampy, quite swampy when the early settlers uh, came through, not so much anymore. So you get these upland swamp forests on the upland areas and even high up, you know, at 1230, 1250 feet on, the, on top of the Sharon Sandstone on the east side. It really doesn't happen on the west side, okay? And then some specialized ones. See, so the HB is the Hemlock Beach, and that you find in these north-facing slopes. So Doan Brook uh, flowing basically westward and northward out of the escarpment uh, has a Hemlock Beach Association. It has Bear Rock um, uh, associations uh, in the Berea Sandstone and Euclid Bluestone Gorge areas. And then of course it has a bit of floodplain forest on the back. You can see similar things for Tinker's Creek to the south of the Chagrin Highlands here. And then uh, let's go down to this one. Big Creek does not go through a deep escarpment ravine. Uh, Big Creek is this nice gorge on the west side, but it doesn't go through these these ge geography controlling sandstones here. So it never gets the 
Hemlock Beach were the bare rock environments, but it has it had a nice floodplain forest prehistorically. And then down here to the beach ridges, once again, our um, uh, black oak uh, savanna forest, which on the west side, you get on three separate beach ridges. Everything's compressed on the east side. So these two ridges run together. I'll just say that there's not so much development of these um, black oak savannas or beach ridge savannas on the east side as there is on the west side. Once again, the west side just appears to be a little drier. All right, so what can we do with this? If we can lay out across the county different kinds of um, features that breed specific habitats for forest and other vascular plants, uh, how can we take advantages, advantage of this? So it goes, the core of this is the oaks. And uh, some of you have, have read uh, Doug Tallamy's book, the most re recent of which is The Nature of Oaks, where he talks about uh, how, important, how important oaks are in the environment because all tree species are old, but you know, there's a big family of oaks, they're very old, and over time they diversified to become ecologically complex. And for Doug Tallamy, the oaks, uh, the oaks harbor a more complex local ecologies than any other tree. So for him, that is a species that we should be planting in the 21st century. And I would agree with that for his reasons, but also, you know, you have, the, the oaks are uh, the anchor species in our region. Once again, we talk about the beech maple climax forest, true, we had that at one time, but you know, beaches are in trouble. They've been in trouble for a while. They don't like disturbance. What have we done for 200 years? Disturb. So beaches have been declining as a major species. Sugar maples uh, are being stressed by climate change. So they may not be a species for the future. That's the two uh, anchor species of that association that are in trouble. So we have to think about what can replace them and oaks will certainly be part of that. Uh, the interesting thing about oaks uh, and uh, the hickories, which I'll get to, is that in our region, the genus Quercus, oak genus, it has quite a few species, okay? And it has uh, at least 10, 10 or 12 here, and they're divided into two groups, the white group and the red group. Um, and uh, it's at this sub uh, genus level, if, if that's of concern, but, um, uh, we have uh, both the whites and reds represented. And the interesting thing is that this represents the divergence between the white and the red oaks is very old. And after this divergence, these two lines started to adapt to very specific conditions. So what you often find is that uh, in a certain environment, let's say a swamp, you will have a member of the red oak group and a member of the white oak group. And in swamps, it's going to be um, pin oak as the wettest adapted oak of the reds and swamp white oak in the, on the white side. Okay, So that gives you kind of double the possibilities for uh, planting and for conserving species in varied environments. And uh, the, the oaks, the, the genus of oaks is the only one that is so diversified in our area. So once again, I think oaks are the anchor, the anchor genus because it has many species that uh, we can apply to very specific situations. The Moses Cleveland trees tell us that. Okay, so uh, talk a little bit about these uh, specific associations. I've introduced them already, but uh, talk about the Beech Ridge Black Oaks, the Clifftop Chestnuts, and then I've already mentioned the Lake Plain White and Red Parallels. Okay, so... This, is, this kind of habitat is gone from our area, but it used to be, mm, it used to be present, never widespread, but present. Still, in the western part of the state, you have areas that are called oak openings. And in this case, the, the Toledo Metro Parks has a reservation that's called oak openings. And you see what it is. It's a, old, it's a fossil beach ridge. That sand is 
uh, 14,000 years old, deposited by Lake Warren. And there's a nice black oak tree. The, the trees don't get very large in these oak savannas because there's not a whole lot of water. Uh, but the beauty here is that you see a open forest and it is, uh, you see all stages from the youngest trees to the oldest trees. And once again, site for, uh, for conserving the forest, uh, for restoring the forest, this is what you want, even in an open forest. And what we rarely have this kind of, of a habitat outside of metro park situations or private reserves. Okay, in any event, the interesting thing about the uh, about the Lake Warren Beach Ridge is that it's the sand is has minerals in it that um, mm, that just uh, drew a whole range of plants, including prickly pear cactus, quite common in the western ones, and used to have it here in the in the in the east side. Now, uh, so here are some of the lower plants. You see some of the oaks in the background and lupines in the front. A whole range of plants that grow on these beach ridges, okay? I'm talking about the trees, but the trees also imply each of these species of trees, black oaks, imply other kinds of vascular plants. Now, I said this is all gone here, but we still have remnants from the old beach ridge forest, the old Lake Warren Ridge forest. And this is a tree, right, a black oak, that is right at the corner of the entryway to the Brower wing of the Clean Museum of Art. You may recognize the couple of boulders that are there and looking mm, kind of uh, northward across to the Museum of Natural History. So this is a wonderful tree. You see, it has been, well, it's wonderful because it still exists. It's not classically beautiful because it's had a lot of dieback and uh, a lot of arbors work on it. But you see, it's a tree. Now, not too far away is one that I really like. This is just south of Mixon Hall. Um, uh, so not too far away from the first tree, another black oak that has a beautiful uh, crown to it and uh, wonderful branching, okay? Also a remnant of that Lake Warren Beach Ridge, okay? So, you know, I think we should be planting black oaks wherever we have these beach ridges that underlie. And that's the major east-west roads on the east side. So Lorraine, Center Ridge, and Detroit on the east side, it's gonna be Euclid Avenue, and Menor Avenue on out to the state line, and also St. Clair uh, outside of Cleveland, east of Cleveland. Okay, that these all had forests where black oak was a major component. One time, we should bring it back. They're beautiful trees. They're well adapted uh, to our latitude and everything else. Now let's go to the swamps, and I mentioned these two already. Uh, two pictures. East side on the left, west side on the right. On the east side in Euclid, those of you uh, who are attending from Euclid, um, you see that that's Lake Plain. This is on East 241st Street, just behind St. Roberts, behind the old St. Roberts. Beautiful swamp white oak tree. Uh, one of the largest trees in Euclid and certainly one of the more beautiful. And on the more, so that's a swamp tree, which we had. It would be a tree in these pin oak flats or the black forest. And on the right picture, this is Rocky River, Avalon Drive, and it's a pin oak. It's been quite abused by utility pruning. Uh, the crown on this used to be a ball or should be just a sphere uh, from, from top. The bottom branches are all gone. The tree is actually not in very good shape, but it represents a pin oak uh, that is remnant of a pin oak flat uh, to the west of the Rocky River. And then we come to one of my favorites, which is the chestnut oak, Quercus montana. And uh, this is an Appalachian tree. This is the northmost of its range. In fact, it doesn't occur, as far as I know, on the west side. It's a northeast tree. And this is in Euclid Creek. You see the creek uh, 120 feet below. And you see how this tree is right on the edge. And its roots are going down into that exposed shale and sandstone, trying to pick the moisture that's held within those uh, rock layers there. And uh, there are more. The tree in the upper left is also a chestnut oak. And if the photo would extend back, there's a whole line of these along that cliff face. This is above Welsh Woods, by the way. You all know Welsh Woods, where the big cliff face is. So you find these chestnut oaks 
Euclid Creek on both sides uh, of the Metro Parks Gorge, east and west. You find them in Nine Mile Creek, Dugway Brook, Doan Brook, and uh, these are a tree of the heights. And they don't, you know, they love this kind of situation here, but this is the kind of tree that we should be planting in the heights, on the heights, and especially in these bare rock situations here. Wonderful tree, uh, has beautiful leaves that you can't see, and the bark, of course, is this wonderfully coarse. Right, and then, <clears throat> You know, our most probably our classically beautiful tree is the white oak, and this was never designated as a Moses Cleveland tree, uh, but it's uh, in South Euclid on the grounds of uh, what used to be St. Gregory the Great Church, and it has a different name now, and right across from the post office on Green Road. So I'm standing on Green Road looking eastward to this tree that is just on the south side of, of the St. Gregory Great uh, Church. And uh, so white oaks, um, white oaks are, well, they grow in many different places, but they like rather dryish. And they have these, this wonderful branching. If they're not closed in by the forest, they branch horizontally. And so they're in some sense are classically beautiful oak. All right, now the hickories also have a number of species and there are at least four here in Northern Ohio. Hickories are slow growing trees but they are important ecologically because they produce hickory nuts and all kinds of things like those nuts. So um, there is, once again, there's the chance with these four species to uh, plant them in specific situations. So the shag bark likes dryish, and those are usually uplands. The shell bark hickory likes dampness. You find usually those in the floodplain, same as the bitter nut, floodplain tree, and the pig nut, is uh, kind of a rare tree in our area, but it uh, will grow mostly anywhere. Hickories are beautiful trees. Uh, the shaggy ones, the shag bark, the shell bark, have that wonderful bark that flakes off. Okay, And then I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any good pictures of the hickories. So I'm going to go finish this up with three, uh, what I'm calling omnipresent species. They are in all the forest variants. You find tulip, cucumber magnolia and tupelo in the beech maple forest, in the oak hickory forest, in the uh, pin oak flats. Uh, these are there in small numbers everywhere. Now, it's my contention that as the other major species have problems, those such as these, which in low numbers are always there, it may be time that these come to the fore. These are among the species that we maybe should plant, that possibly we should plant. And just look at them. So uh, tulip, tulip tree is actually in the magnolia family. And magnolia, when you hear magnolia, what do you think of? A southern tree. And tupelo, same thing. It's an Indian name, but we know it from the south. These three species are at the current northern end of their range. So as climate gets warmer, so we think it will, uh, These the range of these trees is going to head north and we may become in the primary range for these uh, three species and they then should be uh, at the, the upper part of our list for trees to plant. So let's just take a look at these. Tulip trees, you know them are beautiful. They tend to grow straight. Uh, they really love to grow in the forest because they can out compete. They're pretty fast growing. Uh, this is a wonderful tulip tree that's about 120 feet high in Lakeview Cemetery, and um, uh, it's a gorgeous tree. Uh, now, the one that's hard to capture is the cucumber magnolia, and it's a forest tree. Um, they all are forest trees, but you don't find it outside the forest very much. Uh, this one happens to be in Forest Hill Park, uh, just uh, near the uh, Cleveland Heights uh, community center, okay? And uh, you can't see too much of this tree, but it has beautiful leaves and, and leaf structure. Um, and it produces these cucumbers, seed pods, that are very distinctive and the, and the birds love them, okay? So ecologically, they are a good tree. And then finally, uh, Tupelo. And once again, this is a forest tree, so it's hard to get a forest picture. This is obviously not the forest. Some of you may know this, I'm standing on Glenridge Road. Uh, in South Euclid, 
looking kind of northwest to what used to be Glastic, now Rochelin Glastic. And uh, somebody had the great idea to plant their five of these all together, five of these sour gums or tubulos in a line, and they have small uh, glossy leaves. They grow straight, they branch horizontally, they're really good looking trees, and they also in the fall uh, turn a crimson. So um, once again, uh, we have traditionally been in the northern part of the range for tupelos. Now that range moves northward, and these should be a good tree for us. Now, I want to close out with uh, some more general questions. And if uh, uh, with the Early Settlers Association, we're trying to continue this Moses Cleveland Tree Program. We have right now about 60 candidates, trees that we have found that, that uh, um, interested people have found and notified us about, and uh, they range all over the county, outside the county, and they include this one. You all know this. It's sometimes called the Queen of Edgewater, and it's this wonderful weeping willow that's right out there on the break wall, and uh, traditionally this would not be a Moses Cleveland tree. A weep, a willows generally are fast-growing, short-lived, so you know you don't get 250-year-old willows, but nevertheless, what a tree. And so as we take in candidates, we want to broaden up the concept of Moses Cleveland tree to include landmarks of various types. And this is obviously a favorite tree in Cleveland, should be recognized as such. So what is a Moses Cleveland tree? I'm not quite sure. Uh, you know, eventually we'll run out of trees that were part of the forest in 1796. And so we have to be thinking ahead, I think. And we can be creative about this. Um, and I want to say that in closing up, that there are two ways that you can participate in this, that the general public can. And one is through the Early Settlers Association website, the Moses Cleveland Trees page. It's easy to find. And there are quite a few resources on this page, uh, some uh, story maps that I have made. You see five of them listed there on kind of the right-hand side, Moses Cleveland Trees yesterday, today, tomorrow, and White Oaks and the Trees of Lakeview Cemetery. Those are very nice publications that I've managed to put together. There's some primary publications dating back to 46 to 71 and other resources on this uh, Moses Cleveland Trees page. There's also a Moses Cleveland Trees Facebook group page that I made up a couple of months ago, and I just haven't had the time to do anything with. But, you know, these Facebook groups pages, sometimes they get very popular. There's a lot of interest in the Moses Cleveland trees. And, uh, I, you know, with a little care, if I could do it, if I could have some help, anybody who'd like to help me maintain this uh, Facebook group page, uh, I would appreciate it because this should be a forum for exchanging information on Moses Cleveland trees, especially where new candidates lie. All right, so to wrap up, <clears throat> we have these trees that everybody loves. They're survivors from prehistoric times, and they are, I believe, guides for reforesting Cleveland in a nature-based way, a sustainable way. And they provide us with anchor species, identifiable anchor species that have associations with other species that are useful in regrowing our canopy with climate resilience. And they also give us examples of kingpin trees where uh, these trees may have good genetics. And so for the oaks, these are possibly the trees we wanna be collecting acorns from and planting in uh, nurseries to regrow the canopy. And also they tell us which sites really enable trees to grow to be centuries old and which don't. So thank you. That is uh, what I have. And uh, let's go to questions, please. Okay, thanks Roy. I always enjoy your programs and I learn a lot and I learn a lot about the area and trees. I'm trying to get into the chat. We might have some questions. What? Okay. All right. 
We're going to look at the chat first and then uh, see if we have any questions and then we will possibly um, unmute the people. My manager's helping me with this part right now. Okay. So she's going to read the chat questions to you. So if anybody does have questions that you'd like to ask Roy, please do put them in the chat so we can uh, get, we can read them to Roy and uh, he can answer them. We have a very large group, so we think the chat might work a little bit better. So um, we're going to do we're going to try that and see what happens. So there was a question from earlier. Question is, please talk about the maple trees. I don't think of them as typically such long living trees. OK, maple trees. Well, there are a number of species and that is, um, you know, I've said oaks have the most species and hickories have four. Uh, there are about four or five different maple species that are big trees. And the one we know the best is the sugar maple. That's the highland, the cool, humid tree. Uh, sugar maple, obviously, because it's thought to produce the best sap. It's what the, and anyway, that is a tree of the highlands. And it's a big, beautiful, mm, rather slow growing tree, hard wood, wood preferred for furniture and um, other kinds for turning. Uh, so that's a, that is, you know, one of the two major species of the beech maple forest. And it is, um, it does not like disturbance, okay? Neither of the two kingpin species of the beech maple forest uh, appreciate disturbance. So sugar maples, you know, you used to see sugar maples out in the country along any of our state roads, uh, through the county and out into surrounding counties that uh, uh, people had planted sugar maples in a row along the road uh, in front of their farmhouses. So you find a beautiful Greek revival farmhouse and then out front is six sugar maples. Well, maybe there's only one or two now because they have been done in by disturbance generally and that is uh, utilities, underground utilities, overhead utilities, um, impacting roots and branches and also salt. Uh, they're not so tolerant of salt and other problems. New England is having uh, problems with their uh, sugar maples in terms of, of summertime stress. It leads to early color change and uh, leaf drop before normal. And that may be headed this way. Okay, So that is the major species. And then there are the others that are um, less highland and even damper adapted. And we all know silver maples because they are highly adapted to disturbance. And in the 1930s, especially 30s, 40s, uh, municipalities planted silver maples because they grew quickly. And especially in depression times, if you had money to spend on trees, get something to, uh, to kind of help the neighborhoods that were struggling. You know, Cuyahoga County was full of neighborhoods in the 30s that were trying to grow, had grown during the 20s, but it slowed down. So you give them some silver maples and they will look better. Now, what that, that gives us a fast growing tree and you know, they're nice trees, but they tend to get in the sewers. And chances are, if you have a sewer problem, it's a silver maple that's in charge. So it's not a good canopy tree these days. Once it was thought to be, no longer is it thought to be. Related is red maple, another beautiful tree. Uh, red because it really turns nice red. It's uh, similar to silver maple in that it grows quickly, like stamp, and we'll get into your sewers. Uh, but this is probably a better tree. Then there are a number of, of them uh, that, and I start to forget the names here, And uh, but they are of this you divide maples into the hard and soft. And the sugar maple is the hard maple, rock maple sometimes called, and the soft maples are the red and the silver and a few of these other species. The soft maples um, tend to be too prolific to make good urban canopy trees, okay? They tend to spread their seed all over. Uh, I hope that answers the question. That's basically what I have to say about maples. You know, it's. One more thing, the, the sugar maples, uh, I'm afraid their time is limited in our area. So I love the big ones, but in uh, for the city of Euclid, for example, I'm loath to put sugar maple on a planting list because I just don't know if it's going to do well. Let's try another question. 
Okay, there's quite a few coming in. Um, the next one I can actually answer. So the question is, can we access the recording of this later to review? And we are planning to um, get the video here up on YouTube. It does take a couple weeks, but if you go to the library's YouTube channel and I can give you the, a link to share it, Roy, when it's complete, um, you can access it that way. Very good. Uh, our next question is, are there any maps publicly available that would allow me to see what forest existed where I live? I'm sorry, what, what exists? Forest. forest existed in the past? Does yes. it sound like? In That's the past? what it sounds like. Um, there is, well, there is the, if you go to that, um, the Early Settlers Association, Moses Cleveland Tree page, there are quite a few resources there. There is a Google My Maps map of the Moses Cleveland trees. So that's, uh, and I showed that earlier on, there's the one with all the, the yellow oak place marks. Uh, that tells you something about the native forest. There, in those story maps, there are uh, maps of the type that I presented, the colorful maps that talk about earlier forests. But I guess I must say, not yet. Okay? We have done this inventory, completed it in late 2021, and I'm just starting to put these things together. So this is really the first presentation that attempts to synthesize all that we've learned and look forward as much as back. So for this Williams work that I talked about, um, the, the best maps will be what you get when this, uh, when this becomes a YouTube video, all right? But I expect to be working on this through the next couple of years and we'll uh, be publishing maps of that type. This is, uh, okay, I'll finish up that question by saying that maps are difficult to do. And I, I just wonder, I don't think we have a good map making tradition in our region. For whatever reason, we started off on the wrong track and the geological publications, the ecological publications, in my opinion, all have had not so good maps like the Williams map I showed. It was just a hand drawn thing from the mid 1940s. And I'm trying to, to write that, but it takes a while. Okay, next question. Okay, I'm gonna combine the next into two as a two part question because they're related. How thorough was A.B. Williams when he completed his initial inventory of Moses Cleveland trees? And are there other trees that he missed that should be added? And then someone asks, can we send locations of trees which we think may be a CM tree? Or I'm sorry, Moses Cleveland tree. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, there's a lot there. And uh, let me take it in reverse order. So remind me of the first one when I get to it. Sure. Right. Um, there are, uh, yes either through this Facebook group page or the, uh, the uh, Early Settlers Association um, a contact page. Uh, there's, you just say you have a tree that you're interested in and it will get to me one way or another. Or um, if um, my email is generally available, uh, I'm happy to give it out for this purpose. Okay. But those two, those two uh, vehicles, the Moses, the groups page, the Facebook groups page, and the early settlers page should do you. Okay. Now, remind me of the of the other parts of the question. How thorough was How thorough AB was AB Williams? Williams. Okay. And are there trees that he missed? Oh well, yeah. There Williams. Uh, here's the thing: the Moses Cleveland Tree Program above all, was a celebration of trees for the sesquicentennial of 1946. And to do that, Williams had two things in mind. He wanted to represent this native forest, so he designated trees from 23 different species. But the other thing was, he wanted the trees to be visible to the general public. So about 90% of them are along roadways or were along roadways. And that's in part why the survival rate is not great. Uh, because as I mentioned for the sugar maples, a tree along the roadway is going to get uh, impacted above ground and below ground. So he was thorough in the sense of identifying trees that were visible on the public landscape. 
but not at all thorough in identifying big trees throughout the county, most of which were like this tree you're looking at now, you know, buried in the North Chagrin Reservation or on private land. Okay, so uh, as we widen up the concept of Moses Cleland trees, we will depend less on having them visible. We're still interested in the many, many big, beautiful trees that are visible from public roadways, but uh, other trees that are hidden uh, on private and other land, other inaccessible land as well. So there, yeah, there's no lack. There are, I would say there are hundreds of trees in Cuyahoga County that are 200, 250 years old. Okay. And there are many trees that are maybe not that old, but have grown up in urban environments. They aren't remnants of the forest, but they have grown up in cleared environments for the last 120 years or so that are big, huge trees. You know, they're 150 to 200 years old, but still, especially the oaks, like this red oak. A red oak is a tree that in a yard uh, can be five feet in diameter in 120 years. Okay, and what's the first part of that question? Nope, you, I think you got it all. Got it all? Yep. All right. Um, which evergreens are native to the county? Only two, as far as trees. So there are a number of shrubs, evergreens, but the two native evergreen trees are um, uh, hemlock, okay, and that's uh, TSUGA, Tsuga canadensis, and white pine. And I can't remember the species name from white pine. They're two very different trees, uh, evolutionarily speaking, they're, they're quite far apart, but they are both conifers and uh, they are native to our area. And each one has a very interesting story. You know, they don't make good Moses Cleland trees. They don't make good canopy trees, the evergreens uh, so much. So I haven't talked about them tonight, but uh, the hemlocks love these shady north facing ravines and you get these nearly pure hemlock stands or hemlock beach stands that are just a joy to be in. It's like being in a cathedral. And the interesting thing is that they may not, the, the hemlocks may not be all that old in our area. There was a thought, uh, the, the earliest interpretation are, were that these hemlocks, a northern species, have held on as the glaciers retreated, they held on in these north facing uh, ravines and gorges, okay? But um, a newer theory is that the central basin of Lake Erie is rather recent. It's only, instead of being 12,000 years old, that, uh, that the, the old lakes are, the central basin of Lake Erie is only about 3,000 years old. And that's basically that Lake Erie drained at about 12,500 years ago. It basically drained nearly dry and has slowly come up. Well, it's as, as it's slowly come up, our central basin has risen to become rather large. And in it, with the westerly winds, then we get the snow belt from the western basin water. And if that's recent, that means that the beech maple forest and the hemlock component may be fairly recent because the hemlock is absolutely cool humid. And um, so uh, there's a chance that the hemlocks are in the area are only Mm, two to three to 4,000 years old uh, in these north facing valleys. So that's, that's something that, that's a, a question that has not yet been answered. The white pines uh, also are thought to be of somewhat recent origin. And um, you find them in stands. Um, there was, the Shakers had identified, for example, a white pine stand on the north side of Doan Brook <clears throat> at about where Roxborough School is on North Park Boulevard. Okay, and uh, there may be one or two white pines left there. Uh, some of you may know Little Mountain has a, uh, a beautiful stand of white pines. And this, the origin of that is debated. Uh, how old, there, there are some old trees there, but does it represent, because it's a pure stand, does it represent, for example, a fire on the top of Little Mountain at one point? Remember, fires even in our area were common and then uh, the re with the remains of the fire, perhaps you get a, the birds or the wind blows in uh, some seeds for white pines and you get these, that pure stand and other ones around. So the, the conifers are more of a question here, but only to our native white pine and hemlock. 
Okay, our next question is from someone who is a recent retransplant back from Chicago. And he says, I have noticed many magnificent sycamore trees all around Cleveland that I never saw on a daily basis in Chicago. Are there any Moses Cleveland trees, uh, sycamore trees in Cleveland? Yes. <clears throat> uh, there, there were, hmm, there were three originally 1946 and only one is left. And it's a very special case and it's uh, worth a visit if you don't disturb it. It's a tree that may be 400 years old. It's in technically the Cuyahoga uh, Park and it is, um, it's in the city of Independence on Riverview Road on a, um, on a disused part, an abandoned segment of Riverview Road. And the tree has the distinction, it's called, it, it's, um, it's big. Okay, it's eight feet in diameter. And it's uh, maybe it's seven feet, seven and a half feet, but anyway, it's big and it's hollow inside. You can stand two or three people inside easily. Um, it's called uh, various, it has a number of names and there's actually a very nice paper uh, written by uh, Becky McKay and Ryan Trimbath, uh, the tree with many names and it's published online. Uh, you can probably Google tree with many names and it will come up. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, the tree was thought to be a road hazard back during World War II, and about uh, 12 feet above the base, it was dynamited in an attempt to blow off the top and kill the tree. Well, the top got blown off, but that tree kept growing, and sycamores tend to do this. They can sustain damage because they, are, they have to have damp, wet, they're floodplain trees almost nowhere else do they grow, as opposed to the London plane trees, which we all call sycamores, which have a different niche, okay? Uh, but the sycamores are floodplain trees. So this tree has grown, and it's not a pretty tree, but nevertheless, this thing is probably 350 years old anyway, and it's still hanging on, even though uh, it was purposely demolished at one point. Uh, and yes, now I don't know Chicago here very well, and so I guess we can trade. Yes, we have beautiful sycamores, and you in Chicago have beautiful bur oaks. And I fall over when I go um, along the Lakeshore and Indiana Dunes area and, um, and on up the uh, Lakeshore toward Chicago. Next question. Have any of the Cleveland Moses trees been core sampled to determine accurate ages? If so, what were the ages and species sampled? Well, unfortunately, the simple question is no. And um, uh, that's a, a project. There is a, <clears throat> it's a rather specialized thing. I mean, it's, you can learn how to do it, but not too many people do it. And there, uh, I have uh, just not too long ago become aware of a tree ring lab at the College of Worcester. And it's uh, directed by uh, Greg Wiles, professor of uh, ecology at uh, Worcester College. And um, uh, he has worked all around uh, Northern Ohio, but not in Cuyahoga County. So he, neither he nor his students have cored here. And that means not the most clean trees, which are limited to Cuyahoga County. So the, the whoever asked that is right to ask that. You know, we talk about the age of trees based on their circumference or diameter. Each species has a rough growth factor. You measure the diameter and you multiply it by the growth factor and you get a rough indication of age. It's not very accurate. The growth factors were determined almost always on trees growing in the forest, which tend to grow slow. So you uh, try to apply that on open area trees, landscape trees, urban trees, which, you know, if they, if they get old, they're usually in open areas. And these, those trees have grown bigger. So we're in this photograph now, we're looking at this red oak and I can't remember the diameter, but I think it's about five and a half feet. And it is probably without question, 250 years old. But if, when red oaks are all over, uh, the urban environment is landscape trees and they're five feet, uh, six feet in diameter, and they probably are not 200 years old. So we, to me, a Moses Cleveland tree is big. How old it is, is a secondary consideration. 
And Roy, someone's posted um, the growth factors by tree species in the chat. So that's very nice. Okay. Um, yeah. Growth factors are fun. They're absolutely fun, but uh, don't put too much stock in them. Uh, next question is, where would I find info to properly measure a tree and assess its age? I think that's probably answered in that um, growth factors. Right. Um, okay. Oh, boy. If... Um, <clears throat> If that person would like to put an email address in chat, and if Donna, you could send it to me, I could, um, I'm trying to think of a, of a reference right now that has all of that, but I, it just doesn't come to me right now. It's, it's pretty simple, it's four and a half feet, uh, the standard diameter at breast height. Okay, obviously it's a guy thing, uh, four and a half feet. And there, you know, if the tree is on a slope, you have to take care of this. If it's leaning, you have to take care of that. So there's a bit of a trick to it, but you know, for most purposes, you just measure four and a half feet up from the ground and take the circumference and you divide it by 3.1415 and you get the diameter, then you multiply it by the growth factor. It's it's pretty easy. You can probably Google it and get as good. You, I would say Google growth factor, tree growth factor, and, um, and you'll get your answer. Okay, next question. Do you have any thoughts on the hemlocks um, as a dominant species in Grand River Swamp in Ashtabula Central Basin? These trees seem original. Well, um, excuse me, I don't know the, uh, I don't think I know the area. Um, now, so what's original? They're certainly prehistoric. I mean, the stand has to be prehistoric. So much more than 200 years old. There are probably hemlocks, mm, hemlocks don't tend to grow. There were no, Moses Cleveland tree hemlocks designated because they they just aren't a long lived tree, and uh, white pines are longer lived, but we don't have any that are that old. They tend to in the areas where we have them, they tend to white pines more than hemlock were valuable timber trees, so all of our big white pines got taken down. And nothing has grown up in the meantime to replace those big white pines. Um, hemlocks is a little different. They are good timber for some uses, but mostly not. And uh, in any event, they grow, they, when they're in the woods, they tend to grow in areas that uh, promote slow growth. So once again, north facing ravines, sun is limited, temperatures are cool, that's not, where you get fast growth. Uh, so the trees tend to be rather small. And it's, you know, there is the, there's a balance with trees between the individual and the forest. And as I've said several times, when you have a, let's say a big oak or a maple out without competition, it will grow to be big and old. However, in the forest, that same tree, that same genome is going to grow to be smaller and younger before it dies, outcompeted by other trees growing up around it. So for this hemlock stand that I've never seen, hemlocks tend to grow in somewhat pure stands, dense, and none of the individual trees are old. However, the stand itself can be, I think the term was original. Yeah, old, prehistoric. Okay, and this is our last question. Roy, do you work with neighborhoods that have programs to pass out and plant trees? Um, Old Brooklyn, you gave a walk here last year, last fall and this spring, and residents are asking, um, I'm sorry, asking if they would like one. I also, I had a magic, majestic red maple planted last fall and a hop hornbeam. What do you know about hornbeams? So there are two questions uh, there. Okay. Well, let's take, um, let's take the last one first. Hop hornbeams are wonderful trees. They're understory trees. They're hardwoods. 
Um, they are, they're very distinctive. Uh, they're, they're, I think they're just wonderful trees. And uh, they, they, hmm, they aren't usually planted as canopy trees because they're a kind of, they're not understory, but they're kind of mid-story, you might say. They, if left alone, they can grow to be 60 feet high, but um, they, they tend to be smaller trees. They're, they're a slow growing tree, but they have uh, beautiful catkins and then the conifer like seed pods later. Our catkins are the flowers in the spring and then seed pods that are very distinctive. The mature bark is uh, just delightful. It's, uh, how, it's how could nature come up with something so interesting as the bark of a hop hornbeam? Um, so it's a very nice tree that you have planted. What's the other one? Uh, and I think this is a nice way to end us. Do you work with neighborhoods that have okay, programs yeah. to pass out and plant trees? Uh, in the city of Euclid, yes. All right, passing out trees. That is, that's something that used to be popular. It kind of fell off. And now that we're all wanting to plant trees, municipalities are, are struggling to put these together. But there is, there, if you live in the city of Cleveland, for the past several years, there's been a pro program that has uh, been run by, uh, among others, the West Reserve Land Conservancy. So I think if you go to the West Reserve Land Conservancy website, you'll see evidence for this program for the city of Cleveland, and they may have expanded it to others. And it's, it's through the Arbor Day Foundation, okay, a nationwide organization that sponsors Arbor Day forever, and uh, they are partnering on this program. So that's one that does give away trees, but you have to be in a municipality that has subscribed to the program and it costs money to do that. So not everybody does. And uh, there are the municipalities are coming up with these as the demand is increasing. Uh, but I, I just can't comment on any individual municipality. Okay, West Reserve Land Conservancy is the first place to check. Okay, thank you for all your valuable information, Roy. And like uh, Carla said, that was our last question. I wanna thank everybody for attending tonight. And I know we've all learned a lot from Roy and have a good evening and hope to see you at the library soon. And thanks, Roy, it was a great program. You're welcome, my pleasure, always, especially for the city of Euclid. Okay, yeah. definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.